Okay, Dr. Kalamir, as soon as I start recording, wait five seconds and then you can start, okay? Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for our Medical and Professional Affairs Committee meeting. Um, we do have a very busy agenda today, uh, so if I can, let me begin by uh, asking for a motion to approve our minutes. So move. And a second, please. Okay, and uh, please uh, give your vote of approval if you approved of the minutes. Yes. Yes. Okay, our minutes are approved. And let's move on. Um, we are going to have somewhat truncated reports uh, with mainly the salient features, but there are excellent um, written reports as well uh, that have been submitted uh, to the board. So if we can begin, actually, um, it was Dr. Allen here. Good morning. To present. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Dr. Calamia. First, I want to congratulate you on your recent honor um, as one of the top providers in Staten Island. Congratulations. Thank you for that. I appreciate it greatly. Um, and to heed your warning about time, we do have four resolutions and two informational items. So the CMO report will be truncated. I would like to mention the work that's been done by the Behavioral Health Service uh, during the acute COVID pandemic phase. Many of the inpatient units were converted to med surge ICU beds. Currently, all of those units have been re referred back to behavioral health, and they are actively preparing for a second wave of COVID. Updates on two special units, the OPWDD, the uh, unit for developmental disabilities, has been established at Kings County. This unit provides specialized services to the population with developmental disabilities and mental illness, and it's been a success so far in returning patients to their homes and community-based programs. The second special unit is the extended care unit for homeless individuals at Bellevue. This unit provides inpatient treatment on an extended basis to that portion of the population that no longer needs hospitalization but actually medical hospitalization, but does need longer inpatient care in order to obtain a level of stability and recovery before returning to the community. In addition to that, the ongoing behavioral health services includes the Mental Health Service Corps, the Family Justice Center in all five boroughs, maternal depression screening for all women who are pregnant in our facilities, uh, behavioral health and primary care in a shelter, uh, the Meyer Shelter, Expansion of primary care screening for substance use disorder, the CATCH teams, which are utilized to identify substance use disorder in the general care areas, um, the ED leads teams in the emergency department that screens and identifies patients at risk for opiate overdose, Ex continued expansion of the buprenorphine prescription program in the EDs with primary care, as well as behavioral health. Um, and transition of the mobile crisis team to improve their response time to two hours. Although we have two informational items, there are two other informational items that will be presented in the future. Um, one has to do, which was uh, noted in the previous session on quality and care, what we're doing in the operating rooms, improving the operation, operational efficiency of our ORs. Um, the metrics that we're following there are first case on time start, turnaround time, room utilization. Um, we've improved our metrics considerably and now we're ready to grow. We're already at the, have improved beyond where we were pre-COVID and we're ready to grow from there. Um, the other item we'd like to present at a future date is our system-wide enterprise dialysis program. We've learned many lessons during the COVID pandemic peak and one of which is that this virus attacks the renal system as well as the pulmonary system. So we've had an inter interdisciplinary group, including pharmacy facilities, IT, et cetera, to and in close collaboration with nursing to expand our dialysis services across the enterprise. 
So that's the abbreviated report from the, your chief medical officer. I'll turn it over to Natal, Dr. Sineas, our chief nursing officer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I will also um, provide an abbreviated report. I, we did submit 16 pages of amazing work that nursing is doing across the system. After the COVID crisis, we spent a great deal of time offboarding over 4,000 nurses. Uh, this past September, we have a new vendor manager by the name of Right Sourcing, and so we're working with Right Sourcing to prepare for a potential resurgence, ensuring that we have enough staff in place. We also have 23 Council of Nurse Educator work groups happening right now, being led by a Senior Director of Nursing Education. These 23 work groups will really provide an enhancement to nursing education for incumbent and new staff. I would like to bring attention to the work that we're doing in collaboration with the Critical Care Council and the Nephrology Council, as Dr. Allen just mentioned. Uh, we recently developed a pronation therapy guideline, a nasal swab competencies checklist to ensure all of our nurses are trained on how to conduct nasal swab testing. Um, we were able to really adopt education from DOH, so we're really um, happy in terms of the, um, the accuracy and the validity of the information that we have for our staff. Um, last but not least, we're also working on a CRT PD surge plan uh, to ensure that we have more CRT nurses across the system. Central Nursing Office and the Council Nurse Educators have also worked on a course training plan for uh, non-med surge to med surge nurses and also for med surge nurses to work in a critical care setting to ensure that we have enough nurses with the skill set in case of a resurgence. Uh, let's see, what else would I like to really um, discuss today? The clinical ladder program, uh, we are in the process of closing out our first clinical ladder program for New York City Health and Hospitals. We had over 1,700 approved applications. Uh, we will be reviewing the portfolios. Um, we are approving the portfolios, but we will submit it, be submitting to payroll um, in mid-November, so we're really proud of that. Despite the turbulent year that we've had, this is the year of the nurse. We were able to really have a nurse leader retreat, which we're very proud of. And we're going to have a two-part retreat. The second part will take place in November, uh, which will really focus on a healthy work environment and well-being for our nurse leaders. So we're really excited for the key uh, celebrities that have taken their time to really send messages to our nurse leaders uh, to really um, focus on leadership um, this quarter. Um, the board has also asked about nursing surveys. I do want to share that we have rolled out two nursing surveys this year, a Pathway to Excellence designation site assessment survey, and also the NBNQI RN engagement survey. These surveys will be used as baseline data um, as we roll out our care delivery model in 2021 on our Pathway to Excellence. Last but not least, I wanna share two things. One, we had our historic first ever shared governance report out, not a retreat, but a report out this August, where staff really talked about what they're doing to improve the care they provide to our patients here at New York City Health and Hospitals. Right now, I'm at Kings County, where we are recording our 2020 Nursing Excellence Awards. We're very uh, proud of the work that our nurses, our heroes have done over the course of this year. And so this year, we will uh, record their speeches uh, as opposed to all of us meeting at Jacoby. Uh, we will also recognize our past um, board member, Josephine Bolas. We have renamed the Nursing Champion Award uh, after Josephine Bolas. Um, the recipient of the Champion Award will be Dr. Georges, who is the chairperson of the Department of Nursing at Lehman. Um, yeah. And we also have special messages from Board of Directors member uh, Mr. Robert Nolan and also uh, the children of Josephine Bolas, um, U.S. Representative Hakeem Jeffries and New York State Senator Prasad. So very um, proud of, the, of how we're putting this together. I want to really thank Kalicia who has been instrumental in making this happen. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you and please convey uh, for all of us who are there uh, our great wish, you know, best wishes. Um, Josephine was an amazing member of our board, an amazing member of the HHC family. Um, and uh, I think it's just wonderful uh, the way we're honoring her. Um, any questions at all for Dr. Sineas? Okay, if we can then, let's move on to Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. I will be well. Um, 
Um, so just quick uh, regulatory uh, update. Um, so the pandemic uh, resulted in significant number of regulatory changes uh, that continue to impact uh, the plan. The disenrollment moratorium on Medicaid essential plan and subsidized Child Health Plus members continues uh, and is expected to be um, in place at least through the end of uh, 2020 and probably beyond. Um, New York State also continues to mandate no cost sharing both for COVID-19 testing and also for telehealth visits. Um, so members have uh, uh, unlimited uh, access to, to both. Um, in terms of COVID testing, um, as of today, approximately 20% of the population uh, got tested for, for COVID. Uh, membership update, um, our membership has increased um, about 11% since January. Actually, have an updated uh, number now. Now it's uh, above 12% increase in membership, and we're on track to get to 600,000 members by year end. Most of the growth is happening in the Medicaid and essential plan lines of business. Um, and the, the majority of the growth uh, is driven both by constant flow of new members, as well as the disenrollment moratorium. Uh, between January and August of 2020, New York City uh, mainstream Medicaid added 250,000 new lives uh, who are eligible for Medicaid, of which Metro Plus captured approximately 20%. Uh, quick update on uh, the flu vaccine. Obviously, we're uh, entering the, the flu season to encourage our members uh, to get immunized. We are now offering um, um, a monetary incentive to our members to get immunized for the flu. Uh, quick update on, on quality. Uh, we now have our ratings both for STARS uh, for Medicare quality and uh, Medicaid. So. For stars 2021, uh, the plan the plan remains at three and a half stars um, out of five stars. This is uh, for measurement year 2019, and for Medicaid incentive um, results, uh, we placed second in New York State, um, and that placed us in tier two out of five, and qualifies us for uh, incentive premium reward. Of note, there were no tier one ranked plans. All, all plans ranked in tier two and, uh, and below. Um, and then just a quick update um, on benefits. I'll just man mention our gold benefit and Medicare benefits. So gold, which is the city employee um, plan, uh, we are now offering a zero copay uh, for generic medications for city employees who, who choose Metro Plus. Uh, and in addition to gym reimbursement, we also added now weight loss program, program uh, reimbursement for members and their spouses. And for Medicare beneficiaries, as of 2021, uh, we significantly enhanced our benefits. Um, Medicare beneficiaries are eligible uh, to receive $1,500 in over-the-counter card. Uh, they're eligible for uh, green market vouchers uh, that allows them access to fresh food. Uh, we're also now offering gym reimbursement for Medicare members and increased non-emergency transportation benefits. And that concludes my very brief report. Thank you. Thank you again. Any questions at all? Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Dr. No, no. Were you about to? I'm sorry. Um, all right. And just a couple of keeping issues. Just a reminder, this is a joint medical and professional affairs and finance committee meeting. And I welcome and thank those members of the finance committee who are here. Um, and also, Mr. Siegel is actually representing Dr. Katz today. Uh, all right. So if we can actually move on um, to our first action item, Mr. Albertson and Mr. Wilson, I believe, are going to present. hoping to say a few words before we get into our presentation. Would that be okay with you, Dr. Kalamia? Please, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. So good morning, everyone. I just wanted to say a few words to open up um, our proposal to enter into a contract for a pharmacy inventory management system with OmniCell. 
And it seems to me that it was only yesterday that I met all of you sitting in front of you as your chief pharmacy officer um, to change and implement a strategy for pharmacy. And I'm very, very excited today and happy to present to you um, a proposal for the pharmacy inventory management system. Just to give a brief overview, New York City Health and Hospitals to date clearly does not have an inventory management system for such a precious commodity as our drugs. We spend roughly $225 million per year on these products, yet today we have no way to understand what is on our shelves and how it moves freely through our hospitals. So what you're going to see today is a detailed um, list of items on problem potential solving for our pharmacy. So for example, expired medication waste management. So that's pulling expired medications off of our shelves with the understanding of what's exactly on those shelves when we need to pull it and send back to those manufacturers. To date, there is no essential ROI for this when we cannot see. When we have a pharmacy inventory management system, we can see every single vial or bottle uh, of, of pills on those shelves, pull them off, send them back to those manufacturers, and get up to 85% that cost back to us. We also have the ability to see where the drugs move from purchase to shelf to movement to the patient floor, from the nurse to that patient, and thereafter what the effects are. We do not have visibility that, to that today. This system can also be linked into our BCMA or our barcoding system to follow through potential effects and outcomes of, the, of those drugs to better clinical outcomes. And with that said, understanding our inventory better will assist our procurement and supply chain teams with forward buying and purchasing and inventory management going forward. So again, this is something that is very important and a foundation to our business of pharmacy and our very first large initiative that we're putting forth today. So with that, I'd like to pass this over to Joe Wilson and Mr. Paul Albertson for presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kalamia, for allowing me to say a few words. Thank you. I'm yielding the floor. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to execute a 10-year agreement with Omnicell Incorporated to provide Omnicell medication automated dispensing machines for the system's acute care facilities in Carter's uh, LTAC, anesthesia workstations and associated inventory management equipment and software, diversion detection, predictive analytic software, and sterile product preparation with total amount not to exceed $75,651,031. So as a background, currently the only inventory system that we have is a standalone system regarding those inventory cabinets known as automated dispensing machines. So there are currently about 1,900 within the system, and they are not interfaced to any inventory management system, any ordering system, or any billing system. So they, they merely function as standalone uh, systems. So the current vendor is BD Care Fusion Pixis, and they have been our service provider since 2002, and it was um, originally a seven-year agreement. Uh, the contract itself was then re-awarded, re and we are now uh, at the point where we had done a sourcing event so we could do our appropriate due diligence for pricing and vendor. Uh, part of that is understanding the market state. So today there are only two vendors who can provide the cabinets, the inventory software that's associated with it, the, the, the inventory and hardware for IV preparation, as well as the monitoring of anesthesia medication. And those two vendors are Omnicell and BD Care Fusion. Um, both vendors only support their cabinets with their inventory software. So it is an all-in solution. Um, and also both of these vendors um, can meet the IT security requirements um, and especially Active Directory. What we are looking to move forward to in a future state as we transform the pharmacy is exactly what Dr. DeBerry had shared. We are trying to create a complete line of sight of the drug from the distributor from the time it comes off the truck to the shelf, to the compounding area, the nursing area, right to the administration of the patient. So that full line of sight. 
And we would like to do this in real time so we can start making predictive decisions about how we're going to order, how we're going to stock. And we want to reduce the medication stockouts through this seamless interface between the dispensing cabinets and the distributor. So we want to take out the manual processes today of going to cabinets, refixing the inventory, and just those orders flowing right to the distributor and being filled. One of the other areas that we want to address is the sterile compounding challenges. So today, this is an area that has no inventory management. It is done manually. And what this will bring about is our ability to just not only know what's in the inventory, but what's into the amount of the vial. So it is going to track right down to the ML of the vial. And with that, it's also going to give us enhancement to our billing. It's going to let us know um, what has been administered to follow up the billing and also what drug has been wasted that can still be billed to the insurance company. Um, this is going to give us the, the ability to kind of improve and standardize our formulary because of this data of what is actually being administered. Today, we know exactly what is being bought. And now this is going to know what has been stocked, what has been returned, and what has been administered. So we're going to get the complete life cycle of the drug. And this is also going to give us the, the enhanced controlled substance review. Today, this is a manual process with nursing having to count back drugs in the cabinet taking time away from the patient. This is now automated. So this is really at the press of a couple of buttons. So we think this is going to be extremely, you know, pleasing to both nursing and pharmacy that, you know, this manual count process is over and it'll be completely automated. Um, as, we in, as we implement this system, we will be doing a physical inventory to create the PARs. And we are expecting that we will enjoy a cost reduction by being able to bring about the appropriate PAR levels. And as Dr. Dabari said, we're gonna reduce expired medications. We're gonna know whether to rotate the drug, to use it, or to move it out of the system. And what it's also gonna give us the ability to do is use the tools which we already have with Epic and PeopleSoft to its fullest capability of ordering the drug, billing the drug, tracking the drug, and letting the automation do the work so the people don't have to. Regarding the overview of the procurement, uh, so because there are only two vendors, there wasn't a need to do a request for proposal. We had done a negotiated acquisition with pricing due diligence. Um, going through the proposal, OmniCell is less expensive over the proposed 10-year agreement by $4.5 million. And we did extensive work with nursing and pharmacy leadership over the past year to 15 months of reviewing all of this technology and how it would be implemented into the system, and how we would actually use it. Um, besides this kind of due diligence work with our clinical teams, we had presented these findings uh, to the CEO council, the CNO council, EITS leadership, finance, and the directors of pharmacy council. All of the groups were in favor of awarding OmniCell. In the market, OmniCell is utilized by you know, the larger systems here in New York, NYU Langone, New York Presbyterian, and then in the New York City area, Hackensack Meridian, larger institutions like Massachusetts General, a little bit further up East Coast, and then Centara, which is a large system in Virginia. Um, we had done reference checks with both NYU Langone and Presbyterian, and they were very positive feedback. And then for NWBE utilization, OmniCells are leased. So we don't purchase these items. And to get a little bit into the weeds, you saw them as a cabinet, but they're actually leased by component. Each drawer, each cubicle, each section is leased independently because as you change the configuration based upon the drug and the types of patients that you're serving in that area, you need to change the OmniCell. So we have uh, found OmniCell, and OmniCell's helped us as well, find a MWBE leasing company who we will be able to uh, move forward with a 62% MWB subcontracting firm called Corporate, Corporate Leasing Associated, and they are New York State certified WBE. So, you know, in conclusion, Supply Chain Services is seeking approval to enter into contract with OmniCell for an inpatient pharmacy inventory management system, including automated dispensing cabinets. It's going to be a 10 year agreement utilizing fair market value leases with a go live by September of 2021, with an implementation of all hardware and software to be completed by the end of fiscal year 24. 
The cost over the lifetime of the agreement will be $75,651,031. We will enjoy a one-time rebate of $5,139,632 and a WBE subcontracting plan of 62%. Thank you. Well, it sounds like a dramatic change in the in, uh, ability to manage these things effectively and hopefully freeing some time for uh, some of our frontline staff at the same time. So very admirable. Uh, any questions regarding the uh, proposal? Yes, Barbara Lowe. Uh, I have a two part. One is uh, because Stenny is not with us and the MW. I hear, I hear, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll leave that to you then. Uh, my, my main question is, we do have refrigerated trucks. Um, I just have a general question about uh, what our plan is for the continued management of those items and uh, whether it's going to be a workaround or... Um, whether there's a, a plan to intensify the management of those medications that go to refrigerators. So sure, for the inpatient pharmacy, the OmniCells are equipped with software that monitors the refrigerators in the room and they actually have locks on them. So the, the, the refrigerators will work like an extension of the OmniCell. In the inpatient pharmacy, the exact same. So if your inpatient pharmacy has refrigerators or a walk-in, those actually become um, inventory locations within OmniCell. So the same security that you have in a cabinet or a shelf you would have in a refrigerator. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> Vincent, I don't know how you want to go through the question. Are you going to go through each one of those or can I ask my question? No, no, please. Any questions? If any, ask yours now. Go ahead. Th thank you, Vincent. I, I, first, I wanted to thank Daniel. Uh, again, you are a superstar. You bring so much energy, so much impetus to everything you do. I'm really looking forward. And I just want to say that um, uh, also to thank Dr. Katz, because now you're responsible of the NWB procurement strategy, which we started working with. And I'm very happy to see you. And I'm even happier to see what you have achieved here. Can we go back to that slide where it shows the 62%? And I wanted to ask a question, but um, this is a type of very creative thinking that I, I, I really would like to, to that it spread across more of the different units. Uh, because if you put your mind, we have very smart people, very smart people in our organization and in the vendors organization. And if everybody puts their mind into something, I believe they can do it. And having this 62% NWBE uh, subcontracting um, is really very impressive. I just had a, a meeting with another group in which I exhorted them to uh, really go out there and think creatively. I think maybe, Colicia, you can put them in contact with Daniel so that they can follow up and see what they could be done. Um, so I would like to say, do. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Now, I do have a question because I wanted to understand. Is this 62% of only the kind of the furniture, I, I'm calling it furniture, I know that's not the right word, but like the different components, physical components, or is this 62% of, I don't believe it's of the larger contract. Can you go to the next slide, please? Because I, I want to understand the math. So, this 62% is out of how much? Of the 5 million, the 75 million, of, of what is this 62%? Out, out of the 75 million. The least dollars are for the cabinets. So, the software and service is not leased, but the cabinets are. So, that'll be 62% of the 75 million. That's even more impressive. So, I wish I could be there to give you a big hug to all of you. But I will hold you like a bear and it's still helping you for a while. Okay. Please allow me to give you a virtual hug. Please hug me. I want to hug you and you hug me. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's virtual all. hugs. <laughs> virtual hugs are totally permitted. <laughs> so it's okay. I have to be careful. I have to be careful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a question. 
Sure. Um, I'm trying to understand a little bit about how this will, the transition will occur. First, this must be like the ultimate fantasy for nurses mm -hmm. throughout the hospital because it's been 20 years almost in the coming. And so um, I, I, I just, I, the impact is gonna be phenomenal. But what I don't understand is quite how the transition occurs from the old system to the new system in terms of software, physical work that's got to be done. Uh, maybe I missed that. Like, how does that roll out? You want to take it? Oh, sure. So high level, we start with the we start we do it by hospital. We we start with the cabinets, physically taking them out, bringing in the new cabinets, and configuring them with the pharmacy. Next, you add the software into the inpatient pharmacy. So now the inpatient pharmacy is talking to the cabinets. The next two areas in which you do are the carousels, which are the large machines which hold all of the box drug. That is then brought in. And then you would then bring in your last two areas. One is IV prep. And then the last one are the anesthesia workstations, which in, which in essence are small cabinets in the OR to cover the anesthesia drugs. And each time you add one, you're making a little bit of a daisy chain of the software. So it all comes back and talks to the main pharmacy. But what we plan on doing is doing the cabinets and the software in one facility, moving on to the next one. And then a second team will come in and do the carousels, the anesthesia workstations and the IV prep area. So we are going to do that across all 11 hospitals, creating a little bit of a gap within our project management to make sure that the new Coney Island hospital is done all set and ready for their inspections in 22. But well, that's how we plan on going through the system one to 11. And that's, that will take about how long, the whole transition? About, about three to four years to be complete, 100%. Terrific, thank you so much. Thank you for that but question. I have a question, although I should also, I think it's hard to hear, I'm yeah. getting a lot of feedback. I don't know if other people can. Are you hearing that? Okay, I, I I can't give you a virtual hug, but I think this is amazing. It sounds like game changing, Danielle, describing you know sort of the situation and the um, team. It's just uh, really quite amazing that we haven't been able to do this, and now this will really change a lot of things. I mean, from um, as 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 Sally said, the nurses must be very happy. Everybody would be happy, but it, it sounds like you know there's less likelihood of mistake, but also just on the financial side, it seems um, we would be able to recover a lot of cost and, and if, become more efficient. I, I wonder if there's any way to track any of that data as, as you, um, you know, get fully implemented, how that improves. And because I, I, I think that's really important to also show. I, um, I, I guess one of the things I was trying to understand is if, 62% is from the cabinetry, right? I mean, that sounds like it's from the pieces of the leasing, et cetera. The rest of the, what is the rest of the contract for? Is that? So the rest of the contract would be for the software and service of the software. Okay. And then you also would need to purchase the IV prep stations and to purchase the large carousels for holding the boxed inventory. Okay. And because the it's so I was comparing sort of the cost from it. I think we talked about the prior contract was about four point six million annually. And now we'd be going to more like I mean, it's just straight line at seven and a half million annually. So that differentials, we're buying a lot more integration tracking. Is, is that a fair assessment? It, it, it is. We're going from one to five modules and we're also then creating the necessary interfaces for it to speak with Epic and PeopleSoft. Right, that's terrific. And so I, I think this is um, it, it, this is great. And if we can, I'd love to hear, at, you know, af, after we get implemented, how does this affect things? I, I assume it would help with mistakes, like lots of different things that are, are gonna, we could track and, and demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Terrific, thank you. Yeah. Would uh, you say that we are definitely behind the curve in this? I mean, I don't know how we compare to other hospital systems, but is this something that is long overdue, I guess is what I would say. So Sally, this is Danielle, and the answer is yes. yes. Danielle. We are very, very far behind the eight ball here. 
Um, as I've said in the beginning, this is a foundational piece of the pharmacy business, understanding where our inventory is mm -hmm. and how it is moved throughout the health system for our clinicians and our patients to better their outcomes. We do not have visibility today. We are virtually blind. And um, many people tend to believe that building a strategy for pharmacy is kind of at the top level of CDTM, MTM, talking to our patients, integrating PharmDs within their care, which is perfect. However, the foundational piece of a pharmacy business is managing the drug inventory and understanding what's on our shelves mm -hmm. to provide that to our clinicians. Also educating them on what the best pricing is for 340B revenue, but also what's excellent for our patients in terms of outcomes and bridging the gap between the two. With that said, having that available to our clinicians once the decision has been made. So this, as I've said, provides visibility and sight for us, which we do not have today. So in order to build that strategy of pharmacies, we talked about a few months ago when I first got here, mm -hmm. this is where it all begins. This is the foundation of everything for this business, which is why we're coming to you today with this initiative first. Terrific, thank you so much, Danielle. You're welcome, Sally. Vincent, I just wanted to... Uh, um... oh. So I just I just wanted to go back to what uh, Frida brought up, which is like any any sort of information that you can provide later on Danielle, on implementation. I'm looking at slide four where there are like nine points there of the benefits of doing that. Although you don't need to prove that this works, you know, it would be useful to know uh, at a strategic level um, any savings, any benefits for the system, and just to keep it in the back of your mind. Thank you. Dr. Pagan, thank you. So going forward on the operational line of this business, once it is implemented and as we move forward, we absolutely plan on putting KPIs together to present back to you on status as we roll through this initiative. And many of the items that you see on this bulleted list will have um, data to back this up. So we can actually come to the table with dollars saved, um, value of quality of care, decrease in diversion, and such. So as I've said, this provides sight and data to us and integration, which we cannot see today and happy to provide that going forward for this business. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. Hello. I have a question. How far away are we? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. How far away are we from the integration of related data? For instance, IV infusion data from smart pumps and lab values that are really critical to medication administration and usage. Well, yeah, so yeah, so that inf that information does flow into the inpatient farms now through Epic. So getting your lab values and things of, of that nature. So that that may be in a different stream outside of inventory. Okay. Thank you. But it is available today. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, thank you for the superb presentation. If we can now, I'd like to just go individually uh, for approval. Uh, let me begin uh, with Dr. Pagan. Yes. And Ms. Lowe. Yes. And Ms. Wong. Yes. And Ms. Pinheiro. Yeah, I share Fenny's hug. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to Fenny next then. <laughs> yes, I just want to add it to, to this. Uh, uh, Daniela, we were able to get the finance person, the NWB person, the, the, the ph pharmacy person, all happy today. Thank you so much for all you're doing. <laughs> Excellent. And lastly, uh, Mr. Ziegler for Dr. Katz. Yes. Okay, we have unanimous passing, and we can go on now to our next presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Hillary Cohen for um, Hillary Cohen. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. All right. And so, actually, if you wouldn't mind, you certainly have a vote if you could. Uh, no, just, just wanted to remind you I'm here. Um, yes, it sounds great. Thanks. All right. Now it actually is truly unanimous. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Um, if we can, then let's go on to the next presentation or next um, item. And I think Mr. Ziegler, you're going to be presenting that. Great. Thank you so much. This is uh, a, uh, a chance to come back to the board and discuss 
uh, one of our, I think, signature achievements of the last few years in helping our system uh, integrate together, unify as a single system, our, our Hunter system-wide transportation contract. Uh, so we want to take this opportunity to talk about some of that progress we've seen, uh, update you on some of the future work and goals we have for the uh, transportation system, uh, seek your approval to increase the not to exceed in the contract based on uh, some updated modeling and, and corrections we need to make, uh, and then adding in an MWBE component to the contract. So that's what uh, we are here to discuss today. I'm joined on the phone uh, by Caitlin Priestcorn, who helps lead our transportation system along with Akshat. Read the resolution into the record. Of course. Uh, authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to amend the contract with Hunter Ambulance to expand the scope of the contract to cover rates for additional services, including livery and emergency management transportation services, and to increase the not to exceed expense cap from twelve million seventy dollars seventy thousand eight hundred ninety six dollars to thirty six million three hundred and thirty three thousand five hundred and sixteen dollars over five years to account for higher than expected costs and new additions to the scope of the contract. Okay. So with that, just uh, by way of background, I think several board members joined the board right as this contract was initially approved. Uh, it had been a, a multi-year process to seek uh, a, an improved transportation system for health and hospitals. Um, the system previously held contracts with multiple different vendors, uh, some by borough, some by individual facility, um, and the service, frankly, across those vendors was, was quite poor in some cases. Um, facilities calling multiple vendors in succession to see who was available for uh, transport, um, the length of time it would take for an ambulance to arrive, sometimes truly unacceptable uh, and, and dangerous for patient safety. Uh, so this is a, a major improvement for the system to get us all to a single phone number that everybody calls to move somebody for both an emergency trip, an urgent trip, or just a standard uh, discharge or other transport. So the contract was uh, approved at the board, I believe, in February of 2019 um, and implemented beginning in April. Uh, Kalisa can check me on that. I th I, that's, that's from memory. But the contract was signed in April. The first uh, locations around our system to go live were our uh, Bronx facilities. Uh, Queens and Manhattan followed later in that spring and summer, uh, Brooklyn facilities in July. In September, the post-acute facilities in our system who were uh, not part of the original scope of the contract were uh, impressed with the services we've seen and, and joined in, so they, they have become a part of it. Um, and then we added ambulant services over the course of late 2019 into 2020. Uh, next slide. So, with that ramp up, uh, I think there, you know, there was, there was, this was a major strategic initiative. Uh, it's a major change for our system. It's a big lift. Uh, Svetlana Lipanskia, our, our CEO at Coney Island Hospital, worked for our head of acute care services and then uh, was part of my team at, at the time of approval and just did a fantastic job bringing together clinical leaders in uh, emergency management, in cardiology, in neurology and all key specialties across the system, both at uh, sending facilities and typical receiving facilities, most notably uh, Bellevue, uh, to discuss what would be expected of a single vendor, what subcontractors would we require of them, and most challengingly, what would be the protocols to make this seamless integrated system possible. Uh, and I think you know the overwhelming response it, it is uh, is uh, surprise and great satisfaction across our system that this has worked so well and worked as well as it did uh, so quickly. So here on this slide, we just try to draw out a few of the key improvements that we've seen. Uh, th there are more patients being transferred within our system, right? So now our hospitals know uh, that if, they, if their patients need a higher level of care than they can provide at one of their facilities, uh, someone will answer the phone and they can quickly move to another health and hospital facility to get that care. So the patients transferred between our hospitals is up 15% uh, since before the contract was implemented. The, the transfers that are requested are accepted. The ambulance vendor doesn't say, mm, let me check. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you in 20 minutes, half an hour, two hours about whether they're available. 
100% of the trips that are requested are scheduled and responded to, uh, up from 59%. So that's just a dramatic improvement. And the level of, I think, comfort and confidence that our staff around the system feel in, in that change is maybe the most meaningful uh, in, in all of this. Um, the number, the, the amount of transfers completed, and this is a reflection of after clinical consultation between two facilities, when does the trip actually happen? Uh, we're completing them more often. So Bellevue, the most notable, the biggest recipient who tracks this most, most closely, uh, up, was up to 83% of trips completed in August 2020. Uh, it's, a, it's a big improvement from the 73%, the again, on a lower denominator um, in, uh, in uh, 2019 and 2018. And then the trips are happening faster. Uh, this is you know, key to differentiate by specialty and by location, so we try to give a few uh, examples here that are notable. Transfers of cardiology patients to Elmhurst, which, you know, the, the, the key hospital in all of Queens, are half an hour faster. Uh, Stroke and neurology transfers to Bellevue are almost 40 minutes faster. And the total transfer time of any type of transfer to Bellevue is down nearly 40% from when, uh, from before the contract started. So uh, a dramatic change that is faster access to life-saving care, faster turnover of beds, even if it's not an emergency situation, helping a patient get home or get to where they need to get more quickly lets us have space for patients who urgently need our help. Uh, and then we're able to retain more patients in our system for that continuity of care uh, and the, the financial improvement. Uh, the next slide is a, um, is a reflection, a little bit confusing. I, I will have a different version of this for the full board meeting, but uh, the, the blue line is how we trended in uh, the volume of trips prior to the contract, and then the orange line is the increase after. So uh, we've seen a 15% increase in interfacility transfers, and then uh, a, a steeper increase over the year uh, since the contract is implemented. So that's just a reflection of what we talked about on the prior slide. And then the next slide is uh, Bellevue's data through August on total transfer time, uh, a, a, a steady and sharp drop off across all types of transfers to Bellevue happening and getting completed much more quickly. So the next slide uh, is um, we, we signed this contract, obviously, before COVID-19. Uh, we did not have an expectation that we would need it uh, for such an unprecedented event. Uh, but I, I can safely say that without this vendor, uh, I don't think our facilities would have been nearly as successful or safe in the COVID-19 uh, surge than, than, than what we were. Having a single point of contact and accountability for the hundreds of patients that we were moving between our facilities was just absolutely critical. Uh, they, they really did go above and beyond. So um, we, we re-engineered the transfer process, as, as folks know, to have a, uh, you know, a bulk process, multiple people out of an individual facility, starting in the morning, running well into the evening every night. Uh, Hunter worked with us and, and succeeded on that. And the volume was, was significant. Uh, you know, typically, there's a mix of kind of low acuity, non-urgent trips. These were almost all very urgent, high acuity trips. Uh, and we did, over the course of a, a few weeks, 800 patient transfers between our facilities. The highest volume week was 275 transfers. And it was not only critical to relieving our strain, I think it helped give us the confidence and capacity to help some other hospitals around the system that, that aren't part of big systems and uh, you know, needed our assistance to, to receive patients. So uh, we were proud to do that uh, as, uh, as the public hospital system. This is a reflection of that increase in transfer volume. Uh, it's a big spike in COVID as, uh, as reflected here. Um, following that with the decline of inpatient volume around the system and around the city, the, the volume has been uh, more steady and we hope to resume our uh, steady increase as that volume uh, increases. So then on, on slide eight, uh, you know, we do have a, a significant increase to the not to exceed, and I think that's reflective of the, the challenges we had with data going into this on what the current transfer, the prior transfer system looked like. Uh, and then you know, some of the key successes and other things we've had at the, at the uptake of this contract. So um, the, the expenses are higher for uh, three uh, principal reasons. The first is the percentage of um, self-pay and uninsured visits, which is 
what we are billed, right? The, the way the expenses in the contract work is any patient that is transferred, if they have a insurance that covers it, Hunter will bill that insurance directly and Hunter uh, is compensated for that trip by the insurance. If the patient does not have insurance or the trip is for some reason not eligible for insurance coverage, we and Hunter discuss and they bill us for that trip. Um, so that percentage of those trips that we are responsible for has been higher uh, than expected and we are working with some of the facilities that have had particular challenges capturing that insurance information uh, to get it to a more reasonable level. But uh, again, we are, we are proud to serve our uninsured uh, NYC care patients and so um, that, that number is, uh, is a part of driving the cost. The next is uh, our post-acute facilities and a small percentage of, oh, I'm sorry, not the next slide, please, but the, um, the next bullet. Uh, we, we expanded the, the scope of work under the contract because of demands from other parts of the system. Some pediatric transfers, <coughs> post-acute transfers um, also included. So that increased the, the volume of trips and the cost associated. And then finally, the, the contract was finalized at, at Medicare rates. This was part of the presentation and discussion to the board that Medicare was the standard rate that ambulance companies received. For uh, you know, uh, uh, unfortunate reasons, the, the actual number put into the NTE was based on our prior contracts, which was Medicaid rates. Uh, and so the, that, that is the, the majority of the increase in the NTE is just that mm. simple uh, you know, miscalculation. It was, never, it was just a, a, an error on folks' part. So that is, that's a key part of it and, and an unfortunate one, but one to be transparent about and, and talk through with the board in any way folks would like. Um, we do, given the success we've had with Hunter and the value this has been to the system, uh, with the board's approval, hope to explore a few different pilots uh, beginning later this year um, that we would seek your approval on. The first is several systems around the, uh, the city and around the nation uh, use livery services and, and particular baby mobiles to help uh, some of their patients stay connected to their providers and get in for care when access is a challenge. So um, these are not currently provided for under our contract. One of our hospitals, Metropolitan, does this uh, independently at the, at the uh, facility level to contract to bring expectant mothers in for their prenatal care. And then uh, if it's not an emergency and it can be scheduled for their delivery. Um, so we would like to experiment with that to see if that it helps improve the quality of care and the uh, financial return we have on on uh, some of those patients. And then similarly, livery services, which are uh, in some cases covered by Medicaid for patients, um, but other insurance types do not, uh, could be a helpful way to help some of our high-risk patients stay connected to their care, uh, come in and get the services they need for both our quality goals and um, our continuity of care and financial goals. Next, we, you know, Hunter worked extensively for us under the emergency provisions uh, of the contract that we put in during the COVID-19 surge. Uh, they were successful in that, and I think we would hope to codify those provisions in a, in a contract uh, expansion here. So all told, it is, uh, you know, it is a meaningful increase in the not to exceed. It's a $24 million increase in expenses over the projected 12 million for the five years. Um, we still do project a, a meaningful net revenue on the contract over five years um, of, of 68 million. And, you know, we'll continue to uh, evaluate that based on volume changes post-COVID. Um, on the next slide, we, we take you through the revenue projection. The way the revenue projections, or where we track revenue for this contract, we have a baseline of transfers between our facilities that occurred um, prior to this contract being signed. For any incremental increase above that, uh, we work with finance after the fact to try to disaggregate which of those were attributable to the Hunter contract, and then we track the claims, uh, the value of those claims, and the net revenue on those cases, and attribute it as revenue to this contract. So it's a, it's an internal um, uh, you know, allocation of revenue to determine what is attributable to this contract, and um, we've seen you know significant success on it uh, thus far, and we'll you know have to continue to monitor uh, how we are doing on that as as volume changes uh, in the post COVID period. Just as a small note, the FY20 revenue on here is still marked as projected because some of that work of our kind of disaggregating of the cases is 
ongoing, particularly given the COVID period. Right? These were a substantial number of transfers uh, with very high acuity. And uh, so making sure we are you know, fairly allocating the revenue from those trips to this contract versus to you know, facility budgets is, uh, is something that we are working on. And again, we're, you know, we're continuing to improve the contract. And just recently, I think about a month ago, we rolled out new protocols for all of our hospitals that really expanded upon something that Bellevue has tried in certain specialties, but we are now expanding significantly, uh, a just say yes policy. So when uh, one of our hospitals calls to send patients, uh, the ambulance is routed during the time that the clinical teams are discussing uh, the patient's care and what's needed for them. Uh, the ambulance does not wait for the approval from the physician. So this requires real trust and coordination between our hospitals, and I think is you know, not only a best practice, but uh, a reflection of how the contract has helped to bring our uh, facilities together, have specialties uh, you know, become familiar and comfortable with each other to be able to uh, expand upon this. The next slide is, uh, is a discussion of, of MWBE. So at the time of the contracting, Hunter was granted a full waiver of MWBE goals. Uh, with this extension and you know, just with our, our contact with them over the intervening year and a half, uh, we, we recognize and are pushing them to uh, improve upon that. Uh, and we have work to do. So I think at the outset, I, I would like to say discussions with Hunter on this remain ongoing. And uh, you know, should this committee approve this contract, I uh, expect and will require Hunter to have uh, more improvement on these commitments so far before this comes to the full board for approval. I, I think we are, we are not where we need to be yet on the MWBE plan. So just to be um, upfront about that. What they have committed to thus far is uh, some of their fleet maintenance uh, to move over to an MWBE vendor and some of their ambulette business to move over to MWBE vendors. The ambulance is the overwhelming majority of the cost of the contract. And unfortunately, there are, there are no certified MWBE ambulance vendors in the city of New York. So uh, we are, uh, we are uh, not able to move over that bulk of the spend to that portion. Uh, but the piece that I think we really need to work with Hunter on the most is uh, their ambulette, the new livery services, I think we, we need to improve upon the 10, they've committed to a 10% utilization plan for the ambulance services. I think we can move significantly higher on that. And then I think we should work with them, uh, and I appreciate some, some board members' suggestions on this, to develop a more formal and rigorous capacity building plan. Uh, this is an industry, in, in my view, and I think, you know, I hope the board's view, that uh, should have more MWBE vendors and should be, you know, a growth industry. So. That is something that we will work with Hunter on, I think is a, an important part of uh, what our ongoing relationship with them uh, will be like. And, and if it can't be met, we will have to take this contract out uh, to bid again. I, I wouldn't like to do that because the service has been positive, but uh, this is a, a critical area and I think we, we need them to go further. So uh, that is my presentation. The, the request for approval is to expand the scope of the contract to improve, uh, to include rates for livery, emergency management operations and transportation, and to expand the not to exceed cap uh, to 36 million up from 12. So I'm happy to answer any questions. That, and thanks to the video. Um, Matt, um, if yes. I can start, um, I, I just have two points to make and then a question. Number one, uh, when Penny, Jose, Frida, and I visited, uh, I think, all the hospitals last year, it, the hospitals who had it and the hospitals who were going to get into it were so excited. So, um, you know, we just heard firsthand testimonials to how important the system change was, number one. Number two, I don't think of this as a cost expansion. I think of it as a cost correction. We approved Medicare rates. I think we were right to do that. Um, we had the flexibility. There was no reason to struggle with Medicaid uh rates and so uh, just from my own perspective i don't feel we're adding um that amount to the contract uh, i just had a quick question on a uh, transfer request accepted and then completed um when is the transfer request not completed is that like if one hospital won't accept the transfer what does that mean 
Uh, that that is one example of it. I think the the we don't have many of those now. Really, what they are is if there's a consultation between the sending provider and the receiving provider, and the mutual clinical judgment is this patient is either not stable to move, uh, does not need to move. Um, that's the that's the typical process. There there are some where uh, receiving facilities say not uh, we we can't accept this. We don't have room. That's right. The, that's the minority. Uh, yeah. There are other cases. Uh, we hope that they are very rare, where um, you know a sending facility will say, "Actually, I I tried at a health and hospital facility. I will send this patient to a private facility." So that okay. those are the minority cases, but the bulk yes. of them are clinical consultation, and for whatever reason, the patient doesn't end up moving. Okay, and we. Um, uh, you mentioned that some hospitals aren't like have to tighten up their insurance, uh, you know, their insurance, getting insurance when it's available. But aside from that issue, what other issues, if any, would you say have arisen that weren't uh, anticipated? I, I think I'll give you the, the, the kind of best one, right? Uh, you, you don't like to find problems, but there are some problems that you find that uh, reveal good things. The the um, the biggest challenge we've had with meeting the service level agreements of how quickly patients need to start moving from the moment they're called is that the hunter ambulances arrive more quickly than our staff are ready to package up the patient and get them ready to go. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually have data on this, that when a, an emergency trip is requested, and the SLA is hunter has to be on site and moving the patient in 20 minutes. Um, Hunter is there within 20 minutes, but the what we call package time, getting a person <laughs> downstairs, getting all the meds, getting them ready for the ambulance, people are caught off guard, right? They, they, there still is this memory of, I call and the ambulance will be here in an hour and a half, so I've got time, let me take care of this other patient. It's, it's totally understandable. I see. Um, but there is that level of surprise and then we scramble and people are, uh, and Hunter doesn't like it, of course, because their people are waiting in, in, uh, on the floor in the hospital. And so we've, what we've done is we've put transport coordinators from Hunter at multiple facilities to kind of roam around and help with that packaging process. Um, that's a key piece of it. Uh, and then, you know, I think this, this move to the just say yes policy is um, the place of kind of continued learning and improvement. It just requires uh, very rigorous uh, and fast escalation of all if the approval hasn't come and the patient is already in flight. It just requires you to be much more synced up. So, um, you know, how that proceeds and um, how, how much it improves service times, I think, will be another important thing that I'd love to bring back to the board and, and share at a later date. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. Yes, can I? Thank you, Matt. And I, I want to echo Sally's comments. I think, you know, we've talked about a lot of game changing things today. And it's just, a, it's terrific to see uh, um, after the pharmacy inventory and now the transport system, obviously, this is, we've talked about it um, really, really important and, and obviously critical for, for having seen us through COVID as, as it did. And so I, I think this is great. I, I agree with Sally's characterization of. Um, contract amendment, I think it's completely appropriate. So um, I, I, I and you just touched on this, but similar to what we just, we talked about on the pharmacy, it would be great to capture some of this data and be able to show, I, I know, you know, you've already projected a revenue, in, net revenue improvement, but um, similar to what we talked about in strategic planning, I know one of our priorities is OR, you know, enhancement improvement. And, and so I, I'm, helping that being able to to connect and track some of this um and be, report back on it i think would be terrific and and obviously on what the revenue realization is the projected revenue realization absolutely happy happy to do that and i think um you know i may uh, in, introduce you to one of our other transport stars around the system uh dina rackauer from from bellevue who is their transport coordinator you know, so much of bellevue's business is based on transports from around the system. So as we build business plans there around, uh, you know, interventional cardiology, neurosurgery, uh, it, it is dependent upon how well they work with 
the transport system. And so uh, that that could be a good venue to talk about that as well. But thank you for-, thank you for Yeah, because that's not a, something I intuitively would have connected. And um, But hearing and understanding this, I think it's really critical and important. And just seeing some of the data of the improvement already on time and, um, and, and accepted trips and things like that, it's just, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other comments, questions? One quick question with a simple answer. Is this that I should know actually? Is this contract uh, exclusive, meaning like if we wanted to work with another company, we could at any time? Um, well, I believe it is, you know, it is exclusive. It's a, it's a system wide contract. Hunter uh, is required under the contract to have subcontracts uh, with other providers to be able to meet the service level needs. Uh, and Paul is here, I think, can, can speak to it as well. But uh, there was the feeling that this is such a big project, it can't just be hunter ambulances everywhere all the time. Uh, so a classic example of that is, uh, uh, is Empress in the Bronx, right? A, a, a provider really based in the Bronx, strong relationship with Jacoby. They are the hunter subcontractor for the Bronx. Um, so if we if we needed to and we wanted to, we could encourage Hunter to subcontract with additional vendors or specific vendors. Um, but I think breaking apart the the single system wide aspect of it as Hunter is the kind of the first call um, would require an amendment to the contract. Okay, thank you. Being said, I have a question. Um, Please. First of all, thank you, Matt, for uh, a wonderful presentation, very detailed. I will agree with Sally and Frida. Uh, that this is um, a vendor that has provided incredible service, uh, both pre-COVID as well as during COVID. And we saw firsthand when we visit the facilities um, how good the ambulance look with our logo. And I think that, that really adds to it. However, I do have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, if we go back to the revenue, uh, and the chart that shows the pre-COVID and the um, now kind of between COVID uh, trips. Um, I, I do have um, a suggestion that maybe if you go to the chart, um, that more detail could be looked and maybe share with with us uh, that information like the current you notice that the usage of the transportation is at almost at the same level that pre-COVID with uh, a lot lower volume of patients. Um, so um, understanding more how you maintain such a high level, again, there are very good reasons, as you say, um, there is a lot more inter-facility transfers, but understanding more um, what is the impact of those transfers in terms of the service that we provide to the uh, patients and to the uh, operations of the different facilities, both the one sending and the one serving. I think that will be quite helpful. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I think there is a question that I have in terms of the revenue amount um, here in the expenses um, and the net revenue. Um, because of that chart of the increase of the use of the um, transportation, um, I, I think it will be good uh, for you to later come with a little bit more detail on the model used for calculating that net revenue. Um, I do have a little bit of concern that this net revenue may still be a little bit optimistic, like the one that was presented when the contract was first awarded, and you have to readjust. So it's better to maybe look at that more carefully. And I think it aligns with what Frida mentioned of getting more input on, on the finances. So um, I will just encourage that. I, I do believe that this net revenue of 68 million is still um, optimistic. Um, I do believe that it's an important service and, and definitely we wanted to um, make the most financial um, uh, sensible uh, decisions, but we also want to be very clear on what we have and what we don't have. Um, in terms of the contract amount, I may differ a little bit from my colleagues, both Frida and, and Sally. Um, this is like over 300% increase. Um, now, 
why was uh, did occur um well there are a lot of reasons that you have stated but it is a significant increase for one particular contract that is not put for rebid um i, I believe uh, as you have said that um rebidding may not be the most appropriate thing to do for this contract because we are very happy with the services but at the same time the value of their um, contract has increased significant. And that leads me to the MWBE um, uh, component that and I'm glad that you highlighted that you feel that we are not where we should be. We just saw how Danielle uh, was very creative with their contract and then looking at ways in which you have to parcel out. We are all for reducing overhead and reducing you know, like you're saying, one contract with Hunter is good because it reduces our head, this is our point of responsibility, uh, the point contact, the responsiveness. But at the same time, one of the challenges with that is that it becomes more monolithic. We want is for them to open up a little bit and give opportunity. I, I do agree with you that the ambulance may be a significant challenge to this uh, however the ambulette and the delivery system and the baby uh, new one i do believe that there should be a lot more opportunities and i find 10 percent to be um incredibly low for the opportunities there um and also in the fleet maintenance uh, two to four percent um i think there are quite a few mechanics that are from underrepresented groups that could serve this you may have to send it to several different mechanic shops but and certify them and make sure that they go to a rigorous training i think this is all good but you know we have to put the work so uh, i do have concern with the fleet maintenance at two to four percent, I think is, is incredibly low. Um, I do have concern with the ten percent of the MWB plan utilization for ambulance. I do agree that ambulance is a different story, um, um, but I believe that they can do much better with the fleet maintenance and the uh, ambulance and delivery. Um, that that will be just uh, comments. Uh, thank you, Matt, again for for great work. No, thanks. Thank I you. And again, I, I think my uh, my feeling about this is this was a three year contract with two one year options to re renew. Um, Hunter has been a great partner, but this is a competitive industry. And, you know, this is a key part of our goals. And uh, so, you know, I think I, I, I would prefer to, you know, if, if the committee is prepared uh, to move forward to to not bring this to the full board until I have a significant increase on the MWBE commitment. Um, and then, you know, if we're, if we're not able to get that, I think then looking at the options to renew is a very natural and important thing to do if, if we're not able to uh, make any more progress. So um, that's that's my commitment to the committee. And, and again, appreciate your comments and suggestions. We will we will circle back on them and have. I, I had a question about the liveries, and I have to say that I guess because we're just starting up i guess and because it's so integral and we're just starting to see the results i don't want to be hasty um i care deeply about mwbe but um we're you know we're starting this process up and i think we need to explore these new additional pilots but on liveries, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's just because I think livery drivers are so overwhelmingly people of color. Yes. I think that there are lots of livery cab companies owned by people of color. I, yes. I don't, um, so I, that that's just my thought on one area. And the same thing with using um, liveries for transporting pregnant moms. Um, I think both of those lend themselves um to yeah to stronger goals but i wouldn't want i just want to like let it work itself through that's just my goal understood all right if there are any other questions or comments can i have a proposal um to accept this 
Uh, I particularly like uh, my proposal to to really look a little bit of having more conversation with Hunter uh, before moving it to the board. Uh, I, I particularly would prefer that, but um, I'm just one opinion. Well, I, I think if there's no time constraint, um, I think that makes good sense in the, in, in the sense that, you know, unless there's some pressure put, sometimes creative ideas don't tend to flourish. And, you know, it's odd. I mean, we have a great book of business for someone. Uh, I think we just have to marry the fact that there's business here and find a creative way to have people um, who either have companies or perhaps on the, you know, on the cusp of forming them to know that this is, you know, this is business available. So, I mean, I, my only question would be, you know, again, is there a, a time issue here um, that we need to solve. Otherwise, I think Fanny, your idea is, is well, Matt's idea and Fanny's yes, idea is is actually a good idea. Uh, I think uh, you know, perhaps the solution, recommend just because of the timing of uh, M and PA committee meetings. Um, you know, we could we could vote to approve pending uh, uh, the Im the improvements here. Um, there's not a there's not a you know we're not going to hit the cap. And have this service stop in December, um, but you know I think having this cleared up in going into the new year would be great just for our uh, operations and relationships. So defer to you, but that that is uh, that's certainly an acceptable option to me to approve pending that improvement. So, so why don't we actually you know amend to that uh, so that in fact there will be an effort to let them be aware that that in fact we're giving approval, but if we do approve, um, but that it is contingent on their giving some example or some, some some plan to try to improve the MWBE. If I could amend it to that way, then I'd like someone to uh, make that motion actually with the amended component. I can move. And a second, please. I can. <laughs> okay. uh, then if we can, let's do our role, uh, Dr. Pagan. Yes. Uh, Ms. Wong? Yes. Ms. Lowe? Barbara? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. No, that's okay. Thank you. And I think Dr. Katz is here, so um, you can Well, We don't have to have Mr. Ziegler do that. Dr. Katz, you are muted. Okay, Dr. Katz, can you respond? All right, let me let me move on, Fanny, to you. Oh, so, I'm a yes. Uh, I'm so you. sorry, I couldn't uh, yes, figure out how to unmute myself. I'm fine. Yes, thank you. It was so uncharacteristically mute. I was getting nervous, but anyway, <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right. And Sally, you've already said yes. So it does pass unanimously with the amendment that was suggested. Um, I do have to actually leave the meeting at this point. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pagan. Uh, and I again, thank everyone. Uh, this is some really groundbreaking, magnificent stuff being done and, and kudos to everyone involved. I think this is, um, it's been tremendous. So, so I thank you all. I'm going to have to sign off. Appreciate it. Thank you, Vincent. Again, congratulations. Thank you so much. Take care now. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Bye. -bye. Let's uh, continue then. Uh, so, uh, resolution number three, uh, amending the resolution approved by the Board of Directors, the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the system at its October 2015 meeting authorizing the system to negotiate and enter into an agreement, the agreement, with the Physician Affiliate Group of New York, Ms. Bagley, the furnishing of staff required to provide physical and behavioral health services to persons in the custody of the New York City Department of Correction, a copy of which is attached here to the least state to exceed amount for the remaining two two-year terms of the agreement accessible sold by the system at $420 million. Dr. Young? Good. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. First slide. 
Um, so an overview of the contract. Um, this is the original term of the contract, ran from January 1st, 2016 to Dece through December 30th of 2018, um, and was approved to have an option to renew three times for successive two-year terms. Our first renewal period actually ends on December 31st of this year. To avoid disruption in care for the people who are in the custody of the New York City Department of Correction, um, we will need to, CHS Correctional Health Services will need to exercise our option to renew the, the agreement for an additional two year period um, beginning January 1st of 2021 and ending on December 31st of 2022. By background, and uh, Dr. Calamia would remember this as would uh, Ms. Lowe and Ms. Pinheiro, um, CHS uh, transitioned as a, as a service from New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to the health and hospitals in August of 2015. That was the official date that I and a small core of formerly DOHMH employees um, moved over. Um, it was tied to uh, the ending of the Horizon contract, which DOHMH held. Um, that's a private for-profit um, prison personnel provider. Um, and their contract ended with the, with, the, uh, with the health department on December 31st of 2015. So in preparation for that, period of time and the expiration and the decision as part of uh, the mayor's criminal justice reforms was to not renew that, that Horizon contract. Um, so we immediately embarked on vetting and selecting staff who were qualified, who were licensed and appropriately credentialed, and furthermore had the desire to work with us as direct providers um, in a new culture um, of, of care. We, um, ended up hiring about 600, identifying um, about 650 staff, formerly of Corizon, uh, uh, who would come over to us uh, effective January 1st of 2016. Most of them were um, members of 1199 Union. Um, fewer of those were members of Doctors' Council. 1199 um, was not a, a, a union uh, that, that was part of health and hospitals, which led us to need to decide that we needed an affiliate um, after months of negotiation and determining which, who would be a, our inappropriate affiliate, we selected PAGNI, um, uh, effective January 1st of 2016. Um, the, because of the circumstances, the unique circumstances of, of the decision to move correctional health services from a private contractor to health and hospitals, the CHS PAGNI contract is different from, I think, most of the affiliate contracts in the system. First of all, we're, we're different. Correctional Health Services is funded. The, the contract is part of CHS's budget, which is directly funded um, from the city. Uh, CHS is not part of health and hospitals um, expense or revenue. Um, we operate clearly on a, on a calendar year basis, given when we started. It covers members of Doctors' Council and 1199, as I discussed earlier. It covers only frontline providers, no supervisors, no managers. Um, are on the PAGNI staff. They're all, uh, all the clinical leadership and supervision comes from health and hospitals. Um, it, the PAGNI contract includes only payroll, no OTPS, um, including subcontracts unless we specifically pre-authorize it. Um, we virtually have no, no OTPS. Um, and we built into the, the contract um, some, some significant, significant accountability requirements that um, including bi-weekly payrolls, um, monthly general ledgers and monthly cash balances of PAGNI that they need to submit to us so that we can actually ensure that we are we're reimbursing them appropriately. Um, as a result of these, these requirements, the next slide shows you um, so what our costs were um, over the years of the contract so far. Uh, you'll see in, in FY19 and FY20, we reduced those payments by over $8 million as a result of those, those regular reviews of documentation that we get from PAGNI. Um, the, uh, and I think that, you know, that there's a slightly higher payment in FY19 that reflects some uh, workers' compensation payments. Um, and uh, that's the next slide, sorry. And so we're seeking to, um, to get your approval to increase the not to exceed amount for each subsequent two-year extension from 192 million 843 dollars, 453 dollars to 210 million dollars. Um, this accounts for cost of living increases, its collective bargaining increases, and and our own initiatives to improve quality of care and access to care. Um, 
resulting in a total of $420 million, $20 million uh, for the remaining potential four years of the contract. That's 210 each year. And that's, that's it. Thank you so much. Any questions from committee members? I do have one. Uh, uh, Jose, is that okay? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Again, thank you so much for, for the presentation. I, I really appreciate it, uh, Patty. Uh, and good to continue working with you. You definitely have done so much, and I know we'll continue. Uh, my question is, um, in some discussions that we had had with the different um, uh, groups that are looking at the affiliate, uh, one comer, sorry for the sound. Uh, one uh, question is the demographics of the physicians provided through these uh, agreements, um, like with PAGNI. Um, I, I'm not so sure how different is the demographics of the physicians um, that are um, um, kind of working within this agreement. Uh, is there uh, conversations to look at uh, ensuring that um, PAGNI um, broaden or ensure that they have representation and outreach to individuals that can be part of PAGNI that represents kind of the population that they serve, particularly in corrections, because in corrections, uh, I think is overly um, uh, uh, represented by uh, uh, individuals from underrepresented groups. Um, I know that that's not related particular to this, but this is just a question that I have in my mind. Yeah, I, um, certainly most of um, our workforce are, are people of color um, and, and represent uh, very much our patient. Oh, the, uh, the, know, all the, the workforce from PAGNI? Uh, uh, the PAGNI people, um, no, no, I don't think so. The, are you talking about the administration of PAGNI? No, I'm not talking about administration. I'm talking about these are services. These are the, 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 the physicians that, that serve your patients. Is that correct? In the correctional services. Correct. Correct. We, we hire them, and but, they, but we put them on PAGNI payroll. So we select them. Oh, you select them. Yes. Okay, so it's not PAGNI that select them. You no. select them and they're putting right. PAGNI. And right. the demographics of them, you say that represent, are very representative of the population that they serve? Fairly, fairly representative, yeah. I mean, these are people who um, come from the communities that our patients came from and returned to um, that in large part drives their commitment to the work um, that we do. Um, both in the jails and to keep people from coming back into jail. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you have made my day, you and Daniel. Uh, I really love what you just said, and I, I hope that it would be okay with you to share some of that information um, to the community, but I particularly will be interested to the, the, the demographics of, of that group uh, and, and the demographics of your patients, and, 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 and again, thank you so much. Uh, another yeah. big hug, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Tiffany, any other questions from committee members? I'm always love to approve contracts I don't have to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions or comments? Um, okay, so let, let's uh, let's have a, a vote, uh, Dr. Katz. Um, I could barely hear you there, but I, for cats, yeah, I'll ask in a, in a, in a I, I'm sorry, I have you on two different screens. I keep trying to unmute myself on the wrong one. That's why I'm <laughs> having trouble. Anyway, uh, on this one, yes. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Uh, Dr. Cohen, representing Dr. Kunings. Um, yes, also noting I, I need to leave the meeting at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Penioski, uh, Peña Mora? Yes. Sally Hernandez Piñero? I figured that was yes, right? <laughs> Barbara Lowe is here, yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes? Yes. And Frida Wang? Uh, yes, and kudos, Patty. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 
So the resolution passes. Thank you so much, Dr. Yen, for, for your time. Thank you. And we have one last one. Um, pricing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the system, to execute a three year agreement with one year renewals, solely at the system's discretion with Crothal Healthcare, Crothal, uh, to provide environmental management services for all of the system's facilities for the amount not to exceed. $121 million, $273,900. Um, Mr. Alberson, Ms. Redwood. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Pagan. And uh, good morning. My name is Paul Albertson. I'm the Vice President of Supply Chain Services. I'm here to present the request to enter into contract with Crothell Health Services for the management of the Health and Hospitals Environmental Services Program. Uh, by way of background, in 2010, Health and Hospitals decided to develop a competitive RFP, RFP process for the management of these services. Across the country, many health systems utilize external management expertise for these uh, services. Crothall Health was selected and awarded a nine-year agreement in 2011, which ends November 30th of 2020. Uh, over the last uh, nine years, Crotho, in concert with the facility leadership, reduced supply expenses by $39 million, right-sized the staffing workforce through attrition of 240 positions with no layoffs involved. Uh, they standardized cleaning products, cleaning processes, and infection prevention practices uh, across the system, and together, we improved our HCAP scores by 10% as scored by patients on the health and hospital cleanliness. Following consultation with our facility leaders, an, update, an updated RFP was posted for competitive review. While it had been our intent to post it in the spring, due to the COVID pandemic, we were not able to do so as the RFP process requires on-site review by prospective uh, vendors to all of our 21 facilities and dedicated time by our facility leaders to assist in the process. We had updated the RFP to include a number of additional deliverables uh, following conversation with our uh, facility leadership uh, to assure that it spells out planning and implementation of a surge staffing uh, schedule, uh, enhanced facility-based leadership meetings, and also enhanced service, service level agreements and metrics, as well as a greater collaboration with human resources and labor relations management across our system, as we have more than 1,200 environmental workers and we recognize that all of us would benefit from a more collaborative and standardized approach. Uh, following the RFP, we had three companies that submitted proposals, Sodexo, Aramark, and Crothel. Uh, all three vendors met with our evaluation committee in person uh, at Jacoby Medical Center. Uh, Crothel was the recommended vendor of choice by all members uh, evaluated more favorably in each of the review categories. And our review categories were the substantiveness of the proposal, the quality and appropriateness of the firm's experience, uh, and cost. And uh, they were evaluated more favorably than Aramark or Sodexo. Um, following our conversations and review with the evaluation committee, recommendation was presented to first the facility chief operating officers uh, and then to the facility chief executive officers. And both groups also uh, endorsed this selection. We then presented to and received approval from our contract review committee in October. Uh, as we have here on the screen now an example of the Crothel performance that I thought would just be reflective of our patients' experience through their uh, rating of uh, through the CMS HCAP scores of their perceptions of the facility cleanliness. 
And you can see that in each of the four boroughs where Health and Hospitals has uh, acute care facilities, that it's an H and H facility that leads in the cleanliness score in each of the uh, facilities. It, you know, clearly there's more we can do, but it's a nice example of how our patients are experiencing the cleanliness uh, of our environments here. So, go to the next slide. Yes. So, um, the in our review with uh, Crothel, uh, they have agreed to the following elements that I've got here listed on the screen to enhance their team and their team practices. They will add a dedicated human resources labor relations leader to its team, uh, something that was well endorsed by both our labor relations and HR directors uh, who both served on our committee. Uh, also an additional regional director to lead our facility specific engagement. You know, every facility has a director uh, and they report up today to two regionals. We believe that it will enhance our, uh, be our ability to uh, effectively enhance our communication and practice by having three, which our team has agreed to. Crothel will also invest two and a half million dollars and new equipment and technology uh, for our facilities. They'll also, at their own cost, upgrade all of the hand sanitizer technology to a touchless uh, model at our at no cost to us. And you know, today many of those hand sanitizers are wall mounted, uh, and so it's another infection prevention uh, approach that's well received by our employees. They'll also maintain the current pricing as their guaranteed contract price going forward, uh, as well as provide a one-time credit of four and a half million dollars to the health and hospitals. Um, we have also developed, they'll develop a contingency plan to manage all the escalating demands of all types of hazards uh, for safety and continuity of care uh, for our patients and our staff. Crothel has committed to a 30% MWE utilization plan with three certified vendors uh, that we've listed here. Uh, so our ask today is to receive approval to enter into a three-year contract with Crothel for environmental services management uh, with two one-year extensions solely exercisable by health and hospitals. The cost of over the life of the agreement is one hundred twenty-one million two hundred seventy-three thousand nine hundred, uh, and we have, as we've noted here, a thirty percent uh, MWB uh, utilization plan. Uh, so, thank you. That's my kind of abbreviated uh, presentation uh, this afternoon, and I welcome any questions. Any questions from committee members? Jose, I, I have okay. a couple of questions. Yes. Paul, thank you very much. Um, I just. And then thank you for the very thorough presentation. I, I think maybe we did we have a uh, extension at one point with Crothel? It sounds familiar. <laughs> um, uh, no, we did not. Uh -huh. No, oh, perhaps I'm confused. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, um, we do have other Crothel contracts. One for Central Sterile. One for. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to understand. So the, the cost component um, that they are agreeing to maintain, it, it, is that, well, first, the, the staff that are employed are H&H &H staff, right? They provide management services. Is that the way to look at this? Sure. But, yes. They provide the assistant directors, directors, and other uh, some managerial supervisors, all the rest of okay. the H&H &H employees. And then, so the the contract costs that we're paying for that includes supply purchases and other. What is what is in the hundred and twenty? Yeah, correct. It is a uh, supplies. We spend about ten million a year on supplies. We have a a ceiling on the cost uh, for not to exceed uh, that that they are responsible for purchasing, and it's included in this cost as well as. Uh, all of the leadership at the facilities that are profitable employees and all of their fringe benefits, etc. I see. So, but that is a guaranteed maximum cost. So, 
regardless of what, I mean, if we ended up needing a lot more supplies, for example, and um, th does that, is that all covered in the contract cost? It, it is, and that's the experience we've had this summer. So right. uh, they, based on all of that, they had to provide a lot more supplies than anticipated, which they did. Okay, and the, um, it sounds like you got a lot of good, you know, changes in terms of the upgrade of the contract and the new personnel. I think one of the questions I had, and you might have answered this, was when I was looking at the rating. I just lost the um, on my screen, but the the rate the ratings of the um, different facilities. It looks like we've done very well in in some, but not so well in others. Do you know what the or not as well? I should I should say um, what the discrepancy is. Is that is there anything that you know they can help in terms of improving that? Is that based on staffing plans or yeah, I think it is a, 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 it's a great question. Thank you. And I believe it is a combination of, uh, of events here that the ability to assure that we do have uh, all of our staffing there, uh, the day-to-day -day workers uh, that are available, uh, and being able to keep that as a consistent level um, is probably the principal piece that we're working on with each facility uh, and everyone believes that kind of this combination of enhancements with Crothel plus making sure they maintain the minimum staffing is what's going to help us to continue to increase those scores. Our okay. staff have a, you know, very consistent role communication with the, uh, st uh, with the patients as they enter a room, knocking on the door, they have a script, they're engaged with the uh, patients, they talk about what they're going to do while they're in the room, get permission. So there's a great deal of engagement there that also, I think, adds to the high level of satisfaction uh, at, with many of our patients. Great. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Any other questions from board members? No permission. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to the to the vote, Dr. Katz. Yes. Uh, Dr. Peña Mora. Yes. Uh, Ms. Lowe. Yes. Uh, Ms. Frida Wang. Yes. And Mr. Pagan, yes. So the resolution is approved. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, Thank you. And uh, we had two informational items for the meeting today. That I'm gonna uh, we're gonna postpone even even though we're running behind uh, a few things. And uh, any other business or new business to come before this meeting? Hearing now, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.